to share with you a topic that's uh, very close to my heart um, and my wallet these days. Um, I have a lot of, a lot of um, energy for this topic simply because I think it is the future of healthcare um, and I will explain to you a little bit why I believe that. Um, so uh, healthcare is in my blood, I've been in the industry for a couple of decades now. Well, I've worked in Big Pharma and I've worked in Big MedTech. I've consulted to Big Pharma and to Big MedTech. And I've banked, uh, sorry, I've banked, banked to a Big Pharma and MedTech. So um, I've seen the industry from an organic growth perspective, in other words, inside trying to sell the products that we own, and from an inorganic perspective, in other words, how can we grow using other people's stuff? Um, and um, I spent probably about a third of my time in Europe, so I'm very uh, aware of mature markets and two-thirds of my time in Asia, uh, so very much aware of, um, I guess, developing markets, let's say. Um, my last gig in corporate was with Merck, the big American Merck, where I was accountable for the whole region's uh, inorganic growth, where we did a load of M&A, uh, licensing as well as JVs. Um, and the last three years uh, since I left Merck, in fact, um, the anniversary is tomorrow, um, you want, I, you want some flowers ahead? <laughs> from Merck? <laughs> yeah, let's go. Um, and, uh, and set up Propel. Uh, and Propel is still, I would describe, a bit of a proof of concept, but we set out to demonstrate that there was um, value in investing in solutions, uh, health tech solutions, so we're going to make a difference to the delivery of healthcare in Asia. Uh, as Christian rightly pointed out, it's still very much a native space. But it's exciting space. Uh, Goldman Sachs on Monday published a report saying that it was the next big bang. Um, and of course, most of their focus is on what's happening in the US, but it's good to see Goldman backing the, the story. Um, so what I won't do today is talk about how to invest, because uh, that's a whole different story, and will take a whole lot more time. But what I did agree with uh, Christian was to give you a flavor as to why I believe this uh, technology revolution that is affecting our day-to-day -day lives is actually going to change healthcare. Um, to talk about some of the trends that we are seeing, that everybody's seeing at the global level. Some of you will have probably seen those before, depending on how close you are to the topic. Um, and um, then we'll look at some of the trends I'm seeing in, in Asia Pacific. Um, for the last two years or so, I've been working quite hard to understand uh, who's who in the zoo. Uh, of, a, of Asia health tech, uh, simply because it's a, it's a very fragmented um, ecosystem um, and to Christian's point, um, not very well developed. So I keep coming across new, new ideas, new startups, uh, new concepts, and um, it's good to record those to get an understanding of who's doing what and what categories are more popular than others uh, and looking at why that is. Um, and I guess uh, at the end of that, Q&A at the end of that? Yeah, 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 definitely. I don't know how you manage that, okay, good. All right, so, um, healthcare. Uh, it is changing dramatically. So, the healthcare that most of you were brought up to understand, which is, I'm hurting, I'm gonna see a doctor, and he'll prescribe me a tablet, or she'll prescribe me a tablet, and I'll feel better, or actually, the doctor can't do much about it, I'll go to, to the hospital, uh, is changing massively. And uh, it's changing for reasons that are technology, in the same way that your everyday life is changing, you're booking taxis using technology, you're buying your food using technology, you're booking your cinema tickets using technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but it's also changing because in the U.S. and mature markets, they're spending a ton of money um, trying to develop, deliver healthcare, not necessarily with great results, particularly with the U.S. outcomes. Um, and in Asia, in developing markets, you've got the reverse problem, which is there's not enough healthcare to provide, and therefore, how does technology help leapfrog? in very much the same way that a lot of these developing markets are not rolling out copper wire PSTN networks everywhere to deliver phone calls, they're all going straight to mobile phone. Well, the same principle should apply to healthcare. So if you look at Myanmar, should they be building a lot of hospitals or should they be looking at something more radical? Um, we could be spending hours having fun scroll modeling what Myanmar could do for its healthcare. Uh, you could include drones and those other things. It'd be quite a fun exercise, but uh, I'm not sure the politicians will go down that road. Um, but it's, it's in itself quite important to look at how technology is going to change the way in which some healthcare can be delivered. Um, we've had some fascinating conversations already this afternoon. Um, and so there are new opportunities opening up for 
any entrepreneur who understands healthcare, understands technology, and therefore has figured out that the cost of entry into the sector is dropping fast because of technology, because of devices, because of software, uh, because of the fact that the um, uh, patient, the individual, is growing in power in terms of the way in which they're actually seeking healthcare. Um, so I think it's a, a wonderful environment to be stepping into, so much so that, as I explained three years ago, I said, right, stop the big corporate stuff, let's have a go at playing a role at being a catalyst in uh, driving change through technology and delivery of healthcare. Uh, I spent too much time in the discussion in big corporate realizing that actually the availability of cheap drugs is not an issue in Asia. It's actually getting access to those drugs as an issue. And so big corporates such as Merck, Pfizer, Novartis, Sun Pharma, etc., are not necessarily helping by turning up with new drugs at high cost simply because that's not really solving the bulk of the healthcare burden in this, in this part of the world. So why do I believe um, this is changing and what do I believe is changing? Um, I believe there are five key drivers. Data is the first one. We're starting to see that not only are we getting more data, but we've also got access to the data and therefore be able to make a difference. Um, biosensors is the other big change. I deliberately did not call it wearables, and I'll explain why in a minute. So biosensors is the other big change coming about in healthcare. Third one is mobile devices. Um, the sheer number of smartphones out there is starting to make a big difference in terms of the way healthcare is delivered, in the broader sense of the term of healthcare delivery. Fourth one is frugal stroke reverse innovation. How do you leverage certainly the top, sorry, number two and number three on that list to deliver better healthcare rather than buying the big machine with all the bells and whistles that go ping that GE and Philips, etc., make that only a big hospital can afford? Yeah. And finally, um, New, emerging, but 3D printing should not be underestimated. And I'm not talking about printing new organs, that's way down the road. I'm talking about exoskeletons, those kind of things, which can be done actually quite cheaply. But hey, printing new organs is, is coming. It's just probably another 20 years away. Okay, so let's look at data. Data is changing healthcare. And those, to me, are the six broad categories of how data is changing healthcare. So genomics. Everyone heard of genomics? So yeah, so sequencing the DNA, in other words, understanding the computer code that's driving your body. Um, the power of that is fantastic in terms of understanding which bug in your body computer software has gone wrong, and therefore how do you repair that bug. Um, but imagine the power of that when it comes to drug research, when it comes to clinical trials. Um, it's, it's a whole new disruptor of the pharmaceutical industry. The second one is data analytics. Machine learning, AI, and various other deep learning type technologies I mean that not only is data growing, IBM quotes that 90% of the healthcare data we're looking at now was created in the last two years. So you can see that exponential curve of data creation. But the power of the computer in terms of analytics, in terms of pattern um, definition, uh, is growing exponentially as well. And so we're starting to see some real differences being made in relation to the way in which diagnosis is formulated, or certainly research, existing research is being looked at. Um, IBM is capable of loading about 200 million separate unstructured documents in less than a few seconds uh, in order to start looking at it and making cross-references of other data. Um, and they already jumped into bed with Mayo Clinic, Cleveland, Medtronic, Johnson & Johnson, Epic, um, to actually start making that difference. Um, and IBM is absolutely dead set on this. I think Apple's already in that deal as well as um, uh, Google, I think. <coughs> Public awareness. Um, I, I talked about this a little bit this afternoon. Um, the fact that that data is available means that we can start helping people, for example, understand more about disease in an educational way. We can also help them understand the fact that there's counterfeit drugs out there in a, in a sensible way. We can also help them understand the fact that um, where the information is and how to educate themselves around the fact that there are chronic diseases they may be victims of, for example. Uh, support providers, uh, again, that's a mixture of data as well as uh, analytical power, but hospitals, for example, are able to manage themselves in a much more effective and efficient way in terms of the way in which they deliver their healthcare. Uh, and so moving towards outcome, not only just the efficient use of their resources, but also uh, how do they look at all the data they're collecting on patients to start eliminating errors, for example, um, 
uh, be able to spot patterns and take proactive action in relation to things like as simple as MERS, which is the issue that the Korean hospital got wrong very badly earlier on. The sixth one is digital therapeutics. Um, I think that's a fairly common term used now for apps that are used by patients, um, stroke individuals, um, but usually uh, patients who are trying to manage their disease. Uh, and it ranges from not only being able to calculate the right insulin injection you should be making based on various data inputs, but it could be as simple as lifestyle guidance in relation to a cardiovascular patient, for example. Um, and of course, um, drug firms are, are quite liking these on the basis that they help with compliance and adherence around specific chronic disease um, medication um, regimen, uh, such as cardiovascular, for example. Uh, and finally, of course, health ecosystems. Um, it's one under the radar, but an important one, which is how do you aggregate all this data in one place and start being able to make sense of it? Because it's still very siloed. Uh, you know, Fitbit has its own data, Jawbone has its own data, and uh, Apple is doing its own thing, etc. So is there a way of aggregating this data in one place? Um, so Qualcomm started that ball rolling, and um, Apple, of course, having released HealthKit, is helping us, for example, as individuals, be able to carry all our own personal data in one place. We're a far cry from that at this stage, but uh, I think um, some of the early adopters are starting to see how they can collect data from the scales, the Fitbits, and um, you know, my watch is now telling me my heart rate on every 10 minute basis, etc. So I mean, it might be useful one day when I start seeing an uptick in my at rest heart rate, but at this stage it's just collecting uh, my HR data. Um, so that's why I think data is changing uh, healthcare. Uh, and as, um, um, I forget his first name now, but Mr. Goertz, Dr. Goertz uh, pointed out, um, uh, healthcare is about information, it's not about science. Uh, and I think he's right in terms of the amount of wealth of information out there that's being underutilized. That can actually make a big difference in the way in which we diagnose and we administer healthcare. Um, and I haven't got time today, but there's some really interesting um, startups in the US that have had substantial funding and are making a big difference in specific therapy areas. Flat iron is one, for example, uh, in oncology. I'd recommend you hear that one. Okay, the second lever of change is uh, biosensing or biosensors. I deliberately didn't call them wearables because I think the minute you use the word wearables, everybody thinks that you've got something stuck on your wrist. Um, as we all know, the most powerful biosensor is currently in your pocket for most of you. It's a smartphone. It's collecting a ton of information about you. Um, I had a meeting with um, a senior VP at a large insurance company a few months ago um, and pointed out to him that his new iPhone 5S was busy collecting a whole load of data on him that he was unaware of. Um, his reaction was switch it all off. <laughs> um, but I think he found that a bit scary. But, it, but it's important to understand that biosensors, in other words, converting a biological event into a data input that you can use, um, are now becoming a fairly broad variety uh, in the way in which they are being used and the way in which they are collecting data. Uh, so we're all familiar with the Fitbits and the Misfits and the Jawbones, etc. Uh, and some of you, anyone got one on their wrist? One of those type of wearables? Surprising how few people do. My broke down. Your Fitbit broke down? Yeah, yeah. 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 One over there, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so, so um, obviously getting a bit of traction in the US based on the IPO results. But um, uh, so that's, that, that was the first thing that most early adopters uh, decided to, to buy and play with and create a bit of data. And of course, it got a lot of flack and um, criticism simply because it seemed to collect a lot of data but never seemed to get any decent feedback in terms of how we should manage our lives differently. Um, but you need to start somewhere. And um, they are starting to see some use in them, for example, in terms of um, post-heart surgery rehab. Um, the old medical way of dealing with post-heart surgery rehab was to leave you in the hospital bed for weeks on end until they felt you were strong enough to actually get up and move around on a stick. Um, the new way of looking at it is actually you should be doing a mild amount of activity on an increasing basis post-op. And so they're actually using things like Fitbit to give the patients targets of the number of steps that should be undertaken on a daily basis. Um, so it has seen some medical use, which is very encouraging. Um, the thing here is that the number of sensors uh, is increasing in terms of their complexity. The power these sensors consume is reducing as they're getting more sophisticated. And of course, the third element is that battery power or the, long, the, the life of a battery 
uh, is getting a little bit better as um, people like um, Elon Musk start pushing the boundaries of, of battery, uh, battery life. Now the beauty of that is we're going to start seeing, of course, um, biosensors therefore appearing in other types of, um, of um, wearable and inverted commas. Uh, so, of course, we're starting to see more and more smartwatches carrying these things. Um, Garmin's gone into a big way, uh, the Apple Watch does it too. Um, and of course, uh, there are a, few, a plethora of others now out there, uh, such as I think Pebble has got a new one now, etc. Um, but what we're starting to see is smart clothing. Uh, I like smart clothing simply because uh, I think you can do a great deal more analysis of body function and therefore collect more biodata. The professional sports teams have been using this for some time now. Um, most of the uh, National Football League in the US, for example, uh, wear smart clothing and collect a lot of data in relation to their performance on the pitch. Um, so that means that the team tactician and the team doctor are now playing money ball the real way. Uh, rather than looking at historical data, looking at real data on the pitch. And they're able to identify a player that's starting to fatigue or starting to look lame and take action immediately rather than once injury has occurred. Um, so Athos is uh, the BTC version of that. You can't buy it unless you live in the US, uh, but you can buy uh, a similar sort of jersey uh, for yourself uh, at home, um, particularly if you're keen on I don't know, triathlon or something uh, similar to that. And then we start to see patches uh, and ingestibles. Um, the most famous ingestible, so to speak, is uh, Proteus, uh, which was uh, backed by Novartis a couple of years ago. Uh, the idea there is you ingest a uh, sensor at the same time as your medication, uh, and it will start giving some very valuable data in relation to the patient themselves and that medication, ranging from adverse events to uh, you know how does it affect your um, your uh, day to day. I guess performance, so to speak. Um, and then patches and tattoos are quite interesting. Um, in other words, the sensor again is small enough to be able to put into a very small patch that you can just stick to your skin. Um, and um, uh, NC10 is perfecting that. Zio is more recent in terms of that is doing, uh, anyone familiar with the Holter? Which was, which is still, sorry, the gold standard uh, device used for uh, cardiac um, measuring measurement usually done when you've been identified as having been at risk. Uh, it's a box about the size of, I guess, uh, one of the original iPods, let's say. Uh, and you get little suckers you stick all over yourself, wires dangle everywhere. Uh, and it gives some rather accurate information. Well, the Zio is about the size of a Band-Aid, and you stick it on your chest. Um, it has battery power for two weeks, and it will collect exactly the same information. Um, you will find uh, Eric Topol, who's a bit of the forefather or the godfather of digital health. Uh, in 2009, in a TED-Med video, wearing that on stage and showing live uh, his cardiac uh, metrics whilst he's presenting on stage. It's quite interesting to see it wobble and move. Um, so as you can see, that is um, starting to appear. Uh, wearables and biosensors are starting to appear in, in, in different ways in our everyday lives. And, and we'll start meaning that we're collecting much more meaningful data Rather than just steps, it'll be BP, it'll be HR, it'll be oxygenation, it'll be VO2, it'll be a whole load of information that actually will start being able to enable the right analogs uh, to provide some really sensible feedback in relation to the way in which we're living our lives and therefore start to feed that paradigm shift of moving away from disease to prevention. Because we're now being able to own data that helps us be more proactive and take greater ownership of our own health. Okay, third pillar, no more information rather than just pointing out that mobile devices in Asia are reaching everyone. Uh, this is uh, the Climate Perkins uh, Popular Buyers report that came out uh, three or four months ago. Uh, it's a big VC firm, but they're probably famous now because they were sued for um, sexual harassment, weren't they? Or something, or alleged, sorry, alleged sexual harassment. Um, but um, they release a report every year on the internet and how the internet is changing the world. Uh, this data is very interesting to me because it shows not only the size of the population, which we're all familiar with, but more importantly, the sheer number of mobile subscriptions as a relative to the population, but now increasingly important, of course, is smartphone penetration. And when we think fast smartphone, and you guys are probably familiar with this, but you have to ignore Samsung and you have to ignore iPhone. You've got to think about Xiaomi, Carbon, all the low-end smartphone manufacturers in China and India that are knocking out 
full functional smartphones, Android platform for 200 bucks or less. It's 4,000 pesos here, my phone just announced. Yeah? Yeah, 4,000 pesos. It's yeah. like one of these uh, Foxconn so, uh 4,000 pesos. Yeah, so the reality of smartphones being in everyone's pores um, is in, in, in developing markets in Asia, it's highly realistic. Now what's interesting, the data I don't have here to show you is the number of those phones that actually have a 3G connection is, is a fraction of the actual phone ownership. So there's a lot of Wi-Fi usage, but not a lot of 3G usage at this stage. I guess budget doesn't allow for, for 3G usage at this stage in developing markets. But I thought those numbers were very impressive, particularly in terms of where we are now. And of course, I mean, projections are projections, but if you show penetration of smartphones going forwards. Philippines is about to hit 50% by quarter one, 2016. Okay. It's like, it's like pretty old, it's like early, I think we're already at 32, 33, and the last number that I saw okay. is like quarter one, 2016, we have 50%. I think it's 2014 data, well, according to these guys. Anyway, it can only go up and exponentially, and, and we'll go up well, across. Well, already have more mobile phone subscription than population in the Philippines. And that's that doesn't surprise me, I've just seen that. <laughs> there are meetings I've been in so far. <laughs> Okay, so, so that's mobile device, and so I think the, the, re the reality of the first two pillars that I shared with you, data and biosensors, um, is increasingly so in, in developing markets in Asia, simply because increasingly we have that ownership. Now, I'll come back to why I think an individual in developing market with a phone is likely to be a core driver in this part of the world versus, say, Europe. Um, frugal innovation, um, just to represent it, I, I thought I'd put a couple of examples because yeah, most people sort of talk about it differently, but I, I would describe it as saying may take for all. Uh, we had a long conversation about this this afternoon uh, because I think it is a sweet spot for Asia in terms of how do you provide diagnostics um, for, um, I guess, the non 10 percenters, let's say. And by 10 percent, I mean the top 10 percent income in a, in a country. Um, how do you provide that uh, when the big machines that go ping that are made by the big MNCs cost such a fortune? Um, the answer to that is develop something that actually works alongside an iPhone or a smartphone, sorry to be generic here, um, that allows a healthcare professional stroke patient to identify whether you're at risk or not at risk. The idea is not to compete with the big machine that goes ping. The idea is to limit the number of people who are actually using the big machine that goes ping. Um, because then you're reducing the burden on the hospital, you're reducing the burden on the clinic, allowing them healthcare professionals in those entities to deliver better health. I don't you've ever been to a hospital in China, but usually it's a long line of thousands of people around the block and around the game, all holding a token as if you were, I don't know, a globe. Uh, customer service is obviously fantastic. No, it's not the customer service. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's when the new phone gets launched. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, you got this yeah. queue round and round and round the block. Well, it looks like that when you're in a China, yeah, uh, hospital in China. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess you're right. Um, so these are just a few examples ranging from um, what are essentially, um, this is an ECG, single channel ECG. Uh, for those who have not heard of it, of course, it's uh, FDA approved, launched in the US. It's about 120 bucks a piece. It, it ties to an Android, uh, sorry, a Samsung and an iPhone. It will give you a full trace of your, your ECG. Um, they assigned here with Apollo Hospitals in India. And in, uh, Apollo Hospitals are now rolling them out to uh, all their cardiologists uh, and uh, primary care physicians. Uh, so that's one potential option for, for you guys, if you haven't looked at it already. Um, I read them made the, made the Zio, which I referred to earlier on. Uh, so as you can see, it's fairly much bigger than a, than a Band-Aid. Shift Labs are quite interesting. That's the first health tech device that's come out of Y Combinator. Um, and they've come up with, the, you know in the hospital you've got those big drip bags for the saline water or, or blood support, etc. the hang them of big sort of thing on wheels that patients, in, in films they usually have them push them around the corridor, but usually you're in bed with these things are on. Um, these things actually, funnily enough, uh, when they're quite tricky drugs, they're actually tied to a machine that actually uh, measures and feeds it carefully into the patient. So that's for the more complex stuff in ICU, for example. Those things cost a fortune. These guys have turned out with exactly the same machine uh, for I think 250 bucks a piece. Unfortunately for them, of course, the FDA regulatory pathway is draconian, which is intense forever. So they've been clever. They've decided to go down and sell it to the vets. 
see if Doc gets an overdose. You don't care whatever. But, um, <laughs> but you're getting data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're getting data, which you can't use in an FDA, but you can actually prove that the thing works. Yeah. yeah so that's quite interesting. And then Scanadu was, uh, I think, an Indiegogo campaign, which has now raised millions and in fact tens of millions. Um, they're having problems, but that's a classic case of the minute you change a small design point inside your device, you change the way data is being picked, um, measured, and therefore the interpretation of that data. And they had to change a small part where that part was within that. And that thing's the size of a, I call it a puck, but I don't know how many people think an ice hockey game, but imagine something that's about this size, about that thickness, um, which you just hold to your forehead for a couple of minutes, and they will measure literally your body temperature, HR, your VO2, your ECG, your blood pressure, etc. So it, it's, it's it's great for you know, self um, a, a patient level sort of administration. But they had to shift one of the sensors, uh, I believe one of the infrared sensor sensors in there in order to get, um, uh, yeah, I guess, get the design right. Challenge to completely muck up their data. So everything they filed with the FDA, they had to pull back and redo. So they had a, they've suffered a huge delay, which uh, that But it comes back to the fact that when you're in the space of health tech, particularly you're in a space that's clearly in the regulatory pathway, and I say clearly in the degree of, um, of, of um, concern, or caution, sorry, simply because there are, apart from the US, there is a single country in the world where digital health or health tech has regulations defined. So you either find yourself being driven by the medical devices regulations, in the EU for example, or in certain developing markets in Asia, you actually find yourself being forced down the pharmaceutical regulations, which are even further away from where you need to be. Uh, so if you're in Indonesia, for example, BPOM will start looking after your new device, which, which is usually a huge headache, because they don't understand what you're doing. Um, but it's important to understand that regulations can play a huge role in your fate as an entrepreneur with, uh, with a device. So that's reverse innovation. Um, just wanted to touch very briefly on 3D printing um, and, and give you a flavor of some of the things that are actually coming through from 3D printing, ranging from uh, medical equipment, instantly made medical equipment rather than shipping huge boxes and stuff, um, to low-cost prosthetics, and there's some really interesting case studies of um, NGOs uh, building on the spot um, made to measure prosthetics for uh, children and adults who have been victim, of course, of mines or IEDs, etc. Um, and so um, be able to deliver real healthcare, you know, delivery, uh, or care delivery, sorry, on the ground there. Uh, at, at a fraction of the cost of the usual route. Um, and of course, not so crazy as to go and start thinking about bone replacements. In fact, um, I was reading an article last week where um, they use 3D printing to make a um, semi-temporary vertebrae replacement for a patient in the US. Um, so it's interesting to see how 3D printing is starting to play a very, uh, sorry, a growing role, let's say, in surgery. Um, Usually, it's been used to actually uh, print the, the organ that you're going to operate on in order to actually allow the surgeon to get familiar with the organ they're going to focus on and therefore be able to um, increase the precision of their intervention. Um, but now, I'm starting to see a lot more um, in relation to how 3D printing has been used as uh, bone replacements. A uh, lady in Holland had um, uh, a disease which meant her skull was growing and wouldn't stop growing. And so they had to cut most of the skull away uh, because it was obviously crushing her brain. Um, and they replaced it with uh, a special material, but it was 3D printed to exactly the right measurement for her. Um, so a lot of it's still pilots, a lot of laboratory work, but it's, uh, it's gonna it come every day. Sorry, um, for the, for the uh, skull printing, the 3D printing, yeah. do they get the images from a big scan? Uh, usually CT or MRI, yeah, depending on what it is you're trying to measure. So it's actually an actual representation of, so you can actually do graphic surgery for it? Correct. Correct. Particularly when it's very tricky, like a tumor, removing a tumor, for example, yeah. an internal organ. Yeah, absolutely. So that's 3D printing. Anyway, so um, that was a bit of a gallop, but for some of you, some stuff you know already, for others, hopefully some new information there. But just to give you a flavor as to why I think the whole healthcare ecosystem and environment and what we know is about to get turned on its head um, and why um, 
I took the decision to actually start focusing on this, delivery focus on this, rather than continuing to help a large drug firm sell more drugs. Um, so, so I think it's very exciting, and um, so do a lot of investors. Uh, so we look at funding. Um, my, my friend Jack Young at Qualcomm, which were the investors behind. Who made? Okay, major investor behind Fitbit. So they make a lot of money. Um, so uh, he is on record basically saying that um, investments in digital health will only keep growing. And it's fair to say that when you look at the data I'm about to show you, um, we're not only seeing funding growing, but we're starting to see the large MNCs playing an active role in this space as well. So at a high level, more globally, um, what we're definitely seeing is some key themes taking shape in relation to funding, and therefore in relation to what are some of the uh, startup concepts that sell value propositions that have been favored. We're seeing venture capital funding double uh, last year on the year before and quadruple 2011. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, we're certainly starting to see a greater number of tech players coming into the space. Uh, you know, for those who didn't think of it, but Google and Apple are going to be playing a significant role in the delivery of healthcare in the future. Um, strategic investors, we'll look at that as well. But um, they're trying to put 15 million into Google, uh, Glu Glucose, sorry, two, three months ago, which is a diabetes management software. Um, MNA gear flow, definitely strong IPO trend. Certainly in healthcare, IPOs uh, is a very strong activity. There's an accusation that it's getting a bit frothy. Um, and best estimates are that about 10,000 plus digital health or health tech startups across the world. Uh, I suspect that's underestimating it, but uh, it's very difficult to get a handle on the exact number. So let's look at this data on the global level. Um, so as far as growth year on year, um, we're seeing digital health or health tech um, dwarf the other subsectors or sub verticals of, uh, of healthcare. Now, this is year on year growth, so of course it's starting from a small base and therefore large growth will eventually look like a very big bar. But what I was trying to show really is the fact that in terms of the venture capital funding focus uh, and the year-on-year -year focus, we're seeing a very large uptick in terms of health tech. Um, not to say that, of course, we're not seeing some, some growth in biotech and med devices, but the, obviously the investment sizes are much different and the timelines are much different. But to me, it's very encouraging. What's, of course, doubly encouraging is if you then look at this, these bars here, the, the health tech bars, and refer them up to the chart in blue over there, what you'll see is that 2014 total health tech VC funding uh, has doubled 2013, but quadrupled 2011. And for all of the hallmarks we're seeing 2015, we should see at least a match, if not an exceeding, of 2014 during the course of 2015. Uh, only halfway through the year, but it's looking pretty good for, for that, again. Um, so if we dive a little bit into that, in terms of some of the trends year on year, um, You'll see some common trends through. So healthcare consumer engagement is a big one. In other words, um, how do you enable, or how does you know, Joe Average, the individual, the patient, um, get more information in relation to their health, engage with the right doctor, the right healthcare professional, um, uh, if eventually, of course, get more information about their own um, disease, if they've been diagnosed, having a disease, etc. Uh, so that's a common thread throughout, and to some extent, uh, very much aligned with the empowerment of the patient, as we keep hearing. Um, but we're also seeing uh, very closely behind it, analytics and big data. Uh, that topic that I referred to at the beginning, which I believe will be one of the major drivers of change. Now, the reason that is ranking high is, um, well, I guess the delta here is that at this level, you're looking at a fairly large number of deals at a fairly average ticket size in terms of amount invested. Here you're looking at a lower number of deals, but much higher investments, much, much higher. Uh, in the hundreds of millions now in terms of some of the big analytic players in the US. Um, more recently in the US uh, and across the world, we're seeing a big spike in telemedicine in type investments. Now, a large part of that in the US is because the law came in allowing for charging uh, for telemedicine consultation. Um, but we're starting to see, of course, that regulation maturing in a lot of countries around the world. Um, and therefore, um, telehealth as a whole is starting to grow as an area of focus by um, big, MN big MNCs, the physicians, 
as well as, of course, the start I was trying to provide it. But um, I don't think tech will be much further behind. So that's a trend at the global level. Um, sorry about the small script on that, but just to give you a, a flavor, if you look at health tech M&A deals, 47 during the course of 2014, uh, and certainly way more than any of the other uh, sub-verticals um, in, uh, in healthcare. Um, and then if you start digging around, looking at who's doing these deals, so the left-hand column here is the acquirer. Um, you'll see that Becker Dickinson is a player, Aetna is an insurance company, GE, Medtronic, AstraZeneca, Intel, St. Jude, Weight Watchers, who about 18 months ago poo pooed it, saying wearables were all fast and it's a fad, it's go away. And then last year, when his numbers were under plan, came out saying, blaming wearables, his numbers being under plan, so probably acquired something. Um, Roche, uh, Merck, Google, Facebook is even putting money into this space. Uh, and of course, Covidian, which has since been acquired by Medtronic. Um, but that gives you a flavor of what I described there as maturing, but we're starting to see the big strategics coming into the space and acquiring uh, some of the more um, established, let's say, digital health or health tech um, players. A little SMEs, I guess, rather than startups. Okay. So if we look at, um, look at Asia, uh, and some of this stuff you'll be aware of, but I just wanted to reiterate why I think um, we're seeing an equal level of, or we should see an equal level of excitement and energy around health tech in Asia. Um, I love that quote by Joko, uh, we don't know what, and now the president of Indonesia, but because he summed up very much the way we should be looking to develop markets full stop, which is a lot of challenges, but also as a result, a ton of opportunities. Uh, we just need to have the creativity and some funding uh, to make it happen. Um, so the next couple of slides are probably not going to be uh, shattering, but it's worth remembering that healthcare infrastructure in developing markets versus the established markets is, is radically different, be it from you know, underfunding, underspending by governments, but also looking at the number of nurses per thousands of population, sorry, 100,000 population, or the number of doctors. Uh, and so it's fair to say that if a government wanted to ramp these up in order to deliver better health, and how long do you think it will take them? Um, I would suggest a couple of decades, probably. Um, and then you've got governments that don't allow foreigners to come and practice in their market. Like Indonesians, for example, won't allow foreign trained doctors to practice in Indonesia. Uh, and so they really don't help themselves. They end up with a huge population um, with you know, a growing chronic disease um, which, uh, which they can't deal with because they don't have the infrastructure. Um, I had one in hospital beds, etc. but I thought I wouldn't drown you in data. So that's the infrastructure headache. Um, and of course you've got the medical needs headache. If you look at cardiovascular rates, death. This is not prevalence, this is death. Cardiovascular versus established countries that have been dealing with it for some time. Uh, diabetes on the top right. Um, lung cancer, bottom left. Um, even road traffic accidents. Now I put it up there simply because for a big pharma company, road traffic accidents are kind of attractive. But if, if you're J&J &J and your major revenue earner is the trauma vertical in your business, then suddenly this is very interesting. And so if you look at J&J's investments in China, for example, you'll see it's all around trauma. Vietnam's the same thing. They're all buying motorbikes and cars, but the discipline at the wheel and state of the roads, et cetera, means that the RTA is huge. Um, so it's a, it's a big cash cow. Um, but seriously, this means, therefore, that you know, you've got the next headache, which is the fact that the unmet medical need is enormous, and therefore, you know, the first question as an investor is, is there an unmet need? Uh, yeah, huge. Um, so, okay, so we've got headache one, headache two. But the interesting thing about Asia is that you've got not only most people paying for their own healthcare, which is what this is saying, versus established markets. Um, so, co pay at best. Let's say that some markets is pretty much I pay for everything by myself. Um, but on top of that, we've got most of the players in the market dealing with the premium market and ignoring the sub echelons of the pyramid or the diamond as I like to call it. Um, what does that mean? Well that means that essentially 
what's happening in these verticals, or more specifically these two, sorry, is that they're looking for choice, they're looking for value for money. So what we need to do is to try and find solutions we can take to them that are priced correctly and easily accessible. So you can start seeing why mobile devices and data and biosensors are starting to make sense here, particularly when you look at mobile penetration. Yeah. So you're suggesting that we should focus more on generic medicine. Is that correct? That's not okay. No, I wouldn't because generic medicine is to a penny. Every single country in Asia has its own fair share of local manufactured generic medicine. Access, the price of generic medicine is not an issue. It's getting access to the medical professional to diagnose your disease and then give you access to that drug. That's where the issue is. Okay. Yeah? So anyway, so I think we've got the perfect storm in Asia. We've got people who want choice, people who are paying for their own health care, people who are looking for value for money, therefore, um, and facing a massive chronic disease challenge, as well as, of course, the other things I showed you, but looking to their own infrastructure, going, well, I'm not going to get it from there, so I need to find another solution. So the telehealth, for example, is looking promising. Okay, so let's look at some of the Asia trends. Um, some of the ones I've discussed and some of the ones you're very familiar with. Certainly lifestyle and wellness apps uh, are experiencing great traction and growth because middle class affluence is growing fast, um, access to the technology is growing fast, and therefore I can start finding things that help me uh, be healthier. Um, infrastructure management modernization is driving investment. Um, for example, a lot of private equity firms are spending a lot of time looking at how they can get involved in uh, product finance deals to build hospitals and cath labs, for example. Um, but the, there are other elements of the infrastructure that need, uh, need better management uh, and better investment. Chronic disease is, uh, is huge in prevalence here and growing, um, and therefore there is a need to uh, find ways of uh, reducing that burden, but also helping governments, physicians, and of course, patients who are suffering from chronic disease to be able to take greater ownership as to how they manage that um, and how they avoid it getting worse. So the trick is, you know, how do you stop a pre-diabetic becoming diabetic, but also how do you stop a diabetic becoming, you know, terminal diabetic, diabetic um, simply because you're racking up the cost and therefore the level of care you need to provide. Uh, reverse innovation, uh, as I said earlier on, I think it is about med tech for all, or in this particular case, better care at an affordable price. Uh, and of course, we shouldn't lose some sight of the fact that senior healthcare uh, is a massive value pool, the gray dollar as it's called, um, but also one that will become an issue for some of the Asian markets going forward. Um, China is certainly uh, very concerned about how they manage that. So, to look at some of the data in Asia, now this is by no means a complete document. We're still looking at identifying uh, where all the health tech startups are in, uh, in Asia, um, and um, we're also trying to figure out what they actually do. Uh, some of them talk a great story, and so we dig around a little bit, and you find out that um, they're either just started, there's nothing there, or uh, in fact, they're just a, an able consultant, so we're trying to differentiate. But uh, what we're seeing is a bit of a reverse of what's happening in, say, the US or mature markets. So in the US and mature markets, we're seeing a lot of investment going on in genomics, big data, and telehealth. Um, as you can see from that chart, that pie chart, we're not quite seeing that in Asia. What we're seeing in Asia is a lot of money going into consumer health, sorry, a lot of startups and therefore money, but a lot of startups um, are bubbling up in consumer health, uh, navigating the healthcare system, they're always finding a doctor or cheaper drugs. Um, patient engagement, so digital therapeutics I talked about, it. Um, practice engagement, and that ranges from uh, physician, physician to physician type consultation as well as, of course, um, clinic management types, such as EHR or, um, sorry, uh, electronic health records, etc. Um, you only have to go around a few um, doctor's clinics um, in most Asian countries to find that most of it's still driven on bits of paper and a pencil, um, which is fine, but um, uh, what we're seeing is a lot of doctors are starting to see an opportunity to actually um, electronify, whatever the right term is, that data so that they can um, manage their business better and look at better patterns. Um, and we're seeing some growth in sensors and diagnostics, um, uh, largely driven towards the lower price points. So uh, for example, in China, you're starting to see a lot of um, um, accelerometers, stroke um, uh, risk-worn type wearables at a fraction of the cost of, um, of what it costs by a Fitbit. 
which is why I think a lot of people ask questions around the IPO value of Fitbit, because you can buy a Xiaomi wearable for your wrist for what, 20 bucks? 20 bucks, right? This practically does the same thing. Um, so there you go. Um, so, so that really gives you a flavor of the broad categories of health tech startups as we've seen them in Asia. Um, the caveat or caution on this data is it's not a complete feast yet. Uh, so I'm really work, still working on this. Um, but we decided a couple of years ago at Propel that um, we were spending a lot of our time discovering new stuff. Uh, but we weren't necessarily documenting it um, well enough to be able to build a big picture and appreciation of what's happening, what are some of the trends. So we embarked on this. Uh, this is actually on a separate website, so it's not on the Propel website, it's on our website called healthstartups.asia. Um, but you'll see some of the data there. Now the interesting thing is looking at, of course, some of the geographic origination, point of origin, sorry, of the startups. Uh, you won't be surprised to find that India and China are hmm. The, uh, the two gorillas in the room in relation to the sheer number of startups that are coming out of those two countries, uh, and these are just health tech startups. Um, but what's interesting is to see Singapore, uh, despite my criticism of the government not spending enough time trying to facilitate a health tech space, we are seeing quite a few. Now, <coughs> the slightly, uh, what's the word, colouring that needs to be added to that is I think some of the startups are there because it is the right regional headquarters for them rather than necessarily being focused on that market. There's only five million people in Singapore, so you have to ask you know, whether there is a viable business model for a lot of these startups sitting in Singapore. Um, but interesting to see how little there is going on in South Korea and Japan. Now, I value those numbers as much as I can. Uh, the challenge, of course, those markets is a lot of the material is in original language, uh, and therefore it's difficult to decipher. I was a bit impenetrable in terms of getting the data. But I'm told those markets are pretty domestic um, and the pain points are pretty low. In South Korea, you can get healthcare from a physician for not a lot of money. And it's pretty good healthcare and it's usually around the corner. And so the pain point is different. Um, it's a little bit like, um, I, th I guess, being in the UK where your physician's pretty much on tap. You have to wait a little bit for him or her. Um, but it's free and it only costs you about 10 pounds, 20 bucks to actually get your script. So as far as the patient's concerned, the pain point is very low. We come back to that important pain point. Uh, but that's going to give you a, a, a view, um, an insight as to how the healthcare system's going. Um, but diving in a bit more detail, looking at some of the, the deals. So I haven't put all the deals here. I just wanted to give you a flavor of some of the, the key deals um, that have occurred in the last uh, 18 months, um, ranging from China, Me Too, which is doing health and wellness, which picked up 35 million from Matrix. Matrix is a very large VC uh, player in the US to Fractal, which is Indian born, uh, and is very much about finding a doctor. Uh, it also has electronic health record type software, game management software. That picked up 30 million um, US dollars with Sequoia Capital. Sequoia is again another very large US VC that's um, very active in Asia now. Um, that's a series B. Um, in other words, their second big raise uh, for that startup. They've just relocated to Singapore, and they're ready to take on the whole of Asia. They launched recently in the Philippines. Yeah. I've seen them around here. Yeah. Uh, but they've got 30 million dollars of advertising and promotion. Yeah, they're starting to like billboards. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> that kind of money. Um, Peacook is a China sort of sensor diagnostic. It's kind of, uh, anyone familiar with Wittings, the French company that does smart scales and those kind of things? Uh, probably not. Anyway, they do smart scales. It's all domestic stuff. It's stuff you buy at home that measures your, your weight and your fat body percentage and etc. Um, that's wearables and for, for, for better use at home. This is 1MG, I was talking about earlier on this afternoon, it used to be known as Health Car Plus in India. That's about script fulfillment. So come out of the doctor with your script, there's an authentication process to actually um, get authorized by a pharmacist. The pharmacist will then bid for that script with whoever's got the cheapest um, product that meets, meets the bill and then we'll dispatch that particular drive to your front door or office door or wherever. Um, so uh, in a market of 1.2 billion people, um, that's a very promising value proposition for me. Uh, I'm not invested in this guy, but I'm talking to a me too at the moment. Um, that will practically do the same thing, but I think at the moment there's enough market share for a lot of these guys to do well. Um, sorry. Uh, Doc Doc, um, probably the most 
um, heard about deal uh, in Singapore when it comes to health tech. They pick up eight and a half million. Uh, that is a medical tourism um, website. Uh, so essentially pricing a particular operation, for example, between what it would cost you in Singapore to get it done versus getting it done in uh, Bangkok or I'm told KL's doing very well these days, the ringgit being so low. Um, but um, interesting to see that as a small thing of money. Connection Asia, so that's a test consumer health and wellness. Essentially, they're basically rewriting um, the employee benefit or health insurance for the employer business model. Um, they have written a completely new platform and they're taking the market at the moment and they raised 8 million uh, earlier this year. Rico is a uh, sensor, cardiovascular sensor that ties to a analytics back end um, in terms of measuring cardiovascular events. Now their play is a clinical trials. So a large pharmaceutical company running a clinical trial needs to measure on a regular basis the cardiovascular behavior they say of a patient on a particular medication. Um, usually what happens is the patient needs to come on a regular basis to have that assessed by a nurse at a clinic, for example. But this particular device is no longer required. The patient can do it from home. And therefore, by exception, you invite the patient into the clinic if there is an abnormal event. So you can see how you're reducing the cost of the clinical trial substantially. Um, and any clinic that you guys are familiar with. If you're not, Farouk here. Okay. Talk to Farouk. He's engaging patients. Good man. <laughs> All right. Um, just a quick note on accelerated incubators. I got that question earlier on today. Uh, for those of you not familiar with an incubator or accelerator, it's um, what's like this. Isn't it? Pixar is a uh, accelerator. We do everything. Okay. It's, it's such a national or right, anyway. system. Yeah. Accelerated incubator is a dedicated space where startups essentially get all the right ingredients to grow. That. School for startups, um, roughly speaking. Yep. Uh, so in, in Asia, there are about 100 plus incubators uh, in total. So I did not try to put them all on this. Um, but in terms of health tech ones, um, really just one. Um, so in the US, 115 in total call themselves health tech digital health accelerators. The big ones are Rock Health, uh, Startup Health, etc. They're the most famous ones. Uh, largely because of the PR, but also because of some of the success stories. So, um, Rock Health has a startup called Amada, uh, which does behavioral change around chronic disease. Uh, they've recently been listed by the CDC, WHO, as being a benefit to their chronic disease. So, it's a big kudos to those guys. But really, if you look at the landscape in, um, in Asia around health tech dedicated, um, you have AIA, which is the insurance company has launched an accelerator in Hong Kong in this year. Um, and that is really the only pure, dedicated, health tech focused accelerator in the region. The rest, the blue dots, are various accelerators that are um, generic, in terms of they don't have a particular industry focus, but they have been known to have had digital health, sort of health tech um, startups go through them. So for example, JFDI had Helint, which I showed you on the previous slide, for example. Um, this stuff is all mostly um, Singapore government sponsored. Um, MetLife is the other insurance company that's having a go, um, but there's nothing in there, so I can't technically put them up there. Um, and then uh, Rockstar listed down there, that Dutch one that announced the Digital Health Accelerator in Holland launching in October. They were already talking about launching one in Singapore, so. We're starting to see a maturing of the space. We're starting to see a lot more activity in the space. Um, so I think we're starting to see the, the, the funding as well as the ecosystem momentum moving in favor of, uh, of health tech uh, becoming a, um, a, uh, it's an official, a formalized um, focus point for uh, all the stakeholders in healthcare. Um, so really my final slide is to reiterate the fact that I think health tech is disrupting healthcare and hopefully I've given you a flavor of that for those of you who are new to the topic. That technology is a fundamental pillar uh, of that change uh, and will create that paradigm for better healthcare. But Asia healthcare is able to leapfrog uh, its, uh, particularly in developing markets, its own limited healthcare infrastructure and it can do so significantly and substantially. 
the opportunities exist. So for all of you entrepreneurs out there, your accelerators out there, etc., there is a great opportunity to um, make a difference uh, and potentially um, do very well uh, with your with your startup. Um, and with the backing of a number of very big tech firms, telco firms, etc., as everybody really starts focusing on the space. So that's it, really. Um, I was a little bit gallop, just to give you a flavour of how we're seeing the switch between some of the global trends to what's actually physically, specifically happening in Asia. I'm very excited. Um, I hope you are, and um, I look forward to um, hearing from you guys in terms of some of your success stories in the space going forward. Thank you. Any questions? Alright, so up there. Yeah. There? Yeah. There's two there. Yeah. Uh, if you had a if you could choose, or I'm I'm sure you're choosing, what would be the three strongest trends that you would bet on moving forward in the Asia Pacific space or in this region? Strongest trend sorry. The three uh, the strongest three strong, yeah. Trends or one or two specific opportunities that you're focusing on as you think these are the ones with the strongest opportunities in the healthcare, uh, digital health space, um, in the region. Yeah, so what outcome are you, are you looking for? Um, growth in terms of disruption in the space or market share or profitability. Right, um, so at the moment I would suggest that you need to have a bias towards uh, what I described broadly as consumer type um, uh, value propositions. Uh, ones where the consumer can make a choice and use that particular value, uh, <coughs> offering or, or product. Um, the, the more medical specialized um, startups and products uh, are still fairly new uh, and require, I think, a bit more support, both clinically as well as some funding. Uh, so with that in mind, I, and I guess I'd go back to uh, this slide really and say that I think at the moment, you really want to be uh, in these three quadrants in terms of um, low cost to set up versus some of the others, um, higher propensity to create traction at a consumer level, uh, and therefore be able to monetize that going forward. But be wary of the fact that the Asian consumer is already preconditioned in getting stuff free, and therefore it's difficult to convert um, a user into a paying user. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but you've got to be aware of that. I think Fractal is finding that a challenge because everything you're living in is free. And I think Sequoia is old and right. Now you move to a different market, you start monetizing that product. And I think they're finding it quite difficult. What well, more challenging than doing it for free? Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. yeah, question. Um, how do you see the, um, the region um, uh, tackling the uh, um, privacy regulatory? Uh, framework that exists, for example, in the U.S. with HIPAA and all that? Most of the startups have talked to uh, ensure that they're HIPAA compliant in terms of the way they manage data. So until there is a local set of rules, they align themselves with the U.S. rules, for example. Um, so that's in terms of how you manage data. And so, for example, using HIPAA compliant servers for, for the repository of the data. Um, but this is always a bit of a challenging one, really. I think, you know, we have to bear in mind that most of us gave up the right to our privacy when we signed up for credit card. Um, <laughs> and even doubled down on that when we started using Facebook and Google. Um, so we need to be realistic about privacy, I think, generally. It's just we seem to get very <coughs> touchy when it's medical information, when we've already told the whole planet about where we are, what we're eating, what time we go to bed, etc. cetera. Um, but, it's important that there is a careful, uh, careful management of that, uh, so that um, you know people who do want their privacy uh, respected is respected. It's also important to understand that the information ends up in the right hands. So none of us want our health insurance company to be looking at some of our data, probably. Uh, particularly if we've done a genomic test that reveals a precondition to specific disease, for example. So there's a lot of grey areas to have managed. Um, there will always be data breaches too, um, whether malicious hackers or whether stupid decisions such as um, Anthem in the US, the insurance company, not encrypting any of their client data, for example. Um, so it's a long answer that doesn't necessarily answer your question, because I think a lot of the countries in Asia are growing up to the reality that 
um, data privacy is a challenge. Some have raw rules out, so Singapore has, for example. It's been funny watching all the credit card and banks trying to change things and putting new conditions in front of me before they were giving my new credit card, etc. Um, but the digital health companies, health tech companies I talk to, are if there is any um, gray area or um, what's the word I'm for? Um, uncertainty, will align with the strongest precedent out there, which is often enough the US at this stage. Yeah? But always do your local homework if right? you're launching. Any other questions? Back. Uh, from a manufacturing point of view where you're looking at developing certain um, gadgets, just like the one that the, the, the wearables. The wearables. Yeah. From a competitive advantage, the Philippines is not as good in manufacturing compared to, say, China. So, uh, from so a price point. point. Yeah. Right, from a price point. Yeah. Um, so therefore, if, if a startup, let's say, from the Philippines wants to get into that direction, for example. Yeah. Uh, its main challenge will be getting funding for that, getting a good manufacturer for that within the Philippines. So well, we can also go to China if you want. Uh, <laughs> and then they'll steal it, exactly. Um, so what are some of the, looking at that perspective from the Philippine setting, what are your advice for using, for developing stuff like this from the Philippine, in the Philippine economy? At least from Tough one for me to answer me because I'm not that up to speed with the Philippines as a market. Right. Um, my general advice would be, um, if you believe you've got substantial IP and advantage in what you're about to build, you probably don't take it to China. Uh, but I imagine as a result of that substantial advantage, you have a premium in that product, and therefore you could probably afford to um, engage the services of a more high value, high cost type manufacturer. Um, if, however, the differentiating point isn't the manufacturing, the, the hardware, but more the software behind it, or the data that comes out of it, uh, or even the execution of the team in the market, then you can uh, work on the Apple basis kind of thing. Well, Apple's probably, for example, if you want to be design here, but manufactured over there. Right, right. Um, so it's a tough one to answer because there's too many, I guess, ifs and buts in this particular scenario, but hopefully <coughs> that's some sort of useful guidance. Right, right. Thanks. Just, just add, uh, one of the things that are is clear from the Philippines side is that clothing, everyone uses uh, a piece of shirt, right? Uh, Philippines loves to, a Philippine likes to buy t-shirt, etc. Sure. So to use that as a means of monitoring, let's say, health of someone is a good good direction to take. Yep. Uh, so the manufacture of the, the devices within the, the <coughs> cloth mm -hmm. is, the, is the key thing. So I was asking that question. So. Yeah, and, and it comes back to you identifying what is um, your unique advantage there. Right. Uh, you know, is, is it a new textile or is it a device you're fitting in? So Professional sports teams are not using new textile, they're using devices that are embedded in. So right, exactly. You're just essentially manufacturing a dedicated jersey into right. which you can embed things. The right. technology being the, uh, the sensor, the oil embedding. Right. 